Oh, I'm good. Shit. We gotta do. We gotta okay, do. Okay, you choose today. Wait, I lost it. <laughs> Hold on. Hold on. It's gone. Oh, I found it. I found it. Okay, ready? Yes. This intro comes from our lovely listener, Lori. Highs and lows for the day. For the day? Yes. Or you could do the week. Why not? Um, no, I'll do the day. That's fine. I, I love Lori. It's I'm early. It's, it's early in the day. You That's know? true. But a fuck yeah, I'm going with Lori. Okay. High, um, high of the day was uh, Millie was super, super adorable at drop off. And her teacher told me that yesterday Millie was playing mommy and baby. And was like reading to the baby and taking care of the baby. And her teacher was like, oh, is that how your mommy takes care of me? And she said, Millie looked at her and she said, yes. And I have the best mommy ever. So oh, that was my high. Isn't that, that a really good high? Want to cry. And the low is, oh, should I tell the drama for my family this week? Yes. The low is, is that, um, I guess this isn't today this week. Sorry, Lori, I really tried. This week, listen to how scary this is. Two nights ago, my parents were woken up at two in the morning um with horrific banging on their front door of a guy hooded guy in gloves um banging on their door just like trying to like scare people and but here's the funnier part of the story which is that then an hour later he comes back and he was with someone else my parents were like what is happening they like called the police they were scared like they live by themselves you know like you don't know what the frick is happening um my mom was like this is down south they would have gotten shot but we, nobody has guns here <laughs> My mom was like, what do we do? My mom was like, my tiny dog barked. Like, like what? There's like nothing. Um, They came back like an hour later with another guy and they're looking all over. And this guy who was like trying to harass people lost his cell phone in my parents' bushes <laughs> trying to scare them. And the police found it. So I'm just going to say, so that was a low of the week. My parents were really scared. I was really overwhelmed about it. That's like, I've said it to Jen. I saw the movie, The Strangers in high school. And I have been scarred for like me too decades ever since. I, that movie scared the shit out of me. Me too. And you know what? I'm not really scared of scary movies. No, you can. You like like scary movies. I know. And I watch them by myself. Yeah, but okay. That movie though, could you like that movie? Scary though. Yes, because it feels so realistic. Like somebody could just be outside your house. I mean, that's like whenever, especially like when Aaron travels and I'm by myself, my fear is that I look out the window and there's just someone standing there. They're not doing anything, but they're just standing there. Oh. And that's what essentially what happened to my parents this week. They were just standing at their front door, like in their camera. I'm so glad that they're okay. Everything is fine. There is fine. was no actual real danger. Everything is fine, but it doesn't feel like that in the moment, right? Yeah. Like, so oh, that was my wow. highs and lows of the week. Was that drama enough for you? Yeah, that was oh, amazing. Lori, this is actually a really good intro. <laughs> Lori, amazing. And, and maybe at the end of all of this, we should, should we stick with one or should maybe we should keep asking for recommendations? Yeah, I don't know. That's great. I don't know. I love, I love that it so one. far. What do you have? Highs and lows for the day is hard because you know I get up a little later than you. Like you've been up since the crack of dawn. In the past one hour, what is your high and low? Okay, my high is I got a coffee and a bagel. Yo, that... all... mine is so superficial. Yo, coffee and I a bagel. A bagel on a Friday is delicious. I'm telling you. Um, that's a high. What did I do all week? You know, the problem with some of these is that I compartmentalize every single day. Yeah, I'll have to answer yours. <laughs> yeah, yeah, can you please? What did I do all week? Oh, we got lunch with one of our amazing clinicians. Natalia. She's Natalia. People pleasing who's episode. On, who's been on the podcast. She is lovely, but she's been in Pennsylvania. She's usually in California. So we got lunch with her yesterday and that was another high. And then I guess the lowest is she's leaving. She's been in PA for a month. Yes. Hanging out, vibing. And now she's going back to California and we will miss her a lot. That is a low. We thought we were going to see her on Monday, but we're not. Another high is that we're going to Costco on Monday. Let's go on Monday. <laughs> So when this episode, actually, no, we, it, when this episode comes out, we will have already gone to Costco. <laughs> the, okay. I, if you're watching this on YouTube, the amount of excitement that's in Emily's face is <laughs> yeah. on another level. Okay. But if you're a Costco um, shopper, you know, the excitement I'm talking about because I want to Costco. Oh man. What do you think the samples are going to be like? Oh, uh, can't wait for those samples. I love the sample. That's a million. I take million there for lunch. Sometimes we just have 50 samples. It's amazing. Sense the best uh, i love samples that's like when you best. go to an ice cream shop you have to try everything and then you're like okay bye <laughs> wait have you done that no no 
but I thought about I don't it. know how people could do that. Just a little taste. I need more feel, than that. I would feel bad. Which actually right now, Costco has the amazing chip witches that have the, um, you know, the chip witches that are not only the cookies on your side, but then also have the chocolate chips. Yes. Covering the whole, the best chip witches. Wait, there are Costco right isn't now. Isn't that chip witches in general? No, some chip witches do not have. I'm sure it's not the brand chip witch, but like, you know, it's oh. like the other ones, but you got to have also the chocolate yes. chips on the outside. But so Costco has that. Have I ever talked about my Costco hot tub on this show? No, I do don't people think know? so. I'm not sure, but you should announce it. Do people know that I bought a $300, <laughs> which I know $300 is still a lot of money, but yeah. for a hot tub, hot tubs are usually like eight to $10,000. Yeah. And I like kept bringing it up to my partner. I was like, I think I really want to like, it's, it's freaking cold here in the winter, right? Like you run out of shit to do. And I was like, I want a hot tub for the also, winter. Also, Emily is a fish. She just like, a needs fish. to be in water. It's true. Like I am like in water a lot. And so, and then my husband calls me the one day and he was like, Hey, I'm a Costco and they have an inflatable hot tub for $300. And so we bought it and it's amazing. <laughs> Do you still use it? Are you still using it? I was in it two days ago. <laughs> Where is it? Can I it's hang out in it for a little? On Monday. <laughs> you to come over, come swimming on Monday? Yes, of course. Then you bright and go, early. Then you can go in my inflatable hot tub for three hundred dollars. Okay. So if you are Costco, do I have to pay three hundred dollars to be in there? No, you can do it for free. <laughs> okay, I already like bought it. <laughs> but if I had spent eight thousand dollars on a freaking hot tub, I'd still be paying it off probably. At one million percent. But three hundred bucks, I could handle I, that. I might get an inflatable hot tub, put it in my tiny little backyard. It would be so <laughs> it's the cute. only, it and it would be the perfectly. only thing that could be in my backyard is that hot tub. I would That's not be the able only to walk thing, out. Yes. No, I, you would have to jump from your door into the hot tub probably. Which sounds kind of fun. Maybe it's the freedom I'm looking for. Wow. You're Whoa. right. I think you're right. I think that is the freedom you're looking for. But so all I'm saying, if you are a Costco buyer and you have at one point been like, ha, 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 at that inflatable hot tub, I would like you to reconsider, my ha, friend. Ha, ha, ha. <laughs> I would like you to consider the possibilities. You would think that we are sponsored by this Costco <laughs> hot tub. You would think by You're the getting amount. No money for talking about this. Do you Just think Costco sponsors anyone? Do you think Costco? I don't know. I don't we, should reach out. we should reach out. We should reach out. Costco needs influencers. They don't. And we're <laughs> we're popping Nikki's Costco cherry. <gasps> yes, I'm making well that Jen. I we didn't I didn't thankfully. Oh, I hope Nikki's not gonna listen to this before Monday, I don't think. Um she probably will. She's oh no, maybe I'm gonna not. we're gonna buy her a membership on Monday oh, as her gift. Yes. It's only 60 bucks. <laughs> cheaper than a candle from anthropology we should... <laughs> well, that's she's, like, that's like she's gonna listen to this after... <laughs> no she's not she's moving today no but after no. we buy it for her she's oh, gonna yeah. know that's still funny though yeah yeah okay we're good <laughs> we should wrap it we should wrap it in a big box okay wow we really Wait, just you know, the way we should wrap this transition in a goddamn yes yeah, wrap it in a big box and now. put it away and never open it again <laughs> We really, really took this shooting the shit to another level. Well, Lori, we apologize. Lori had a great intro, but I don't know if it was good for us. Someone told me once um, that they'll listen to podcasts. I think I've said this before. And like a lot of podcasts like shoot the shit for way too long. And that like, we don't do that. (laughs) And so whoever said that to me, I forget who it was. I apologize. (laughs) Life transitions and anxiety that accompanies them. There it is. There it is. Not going to waste time transitioning in. We're going to start right there. Today's episode is about life transitions and the anxiety that accompanies them. This is huge. We go through so many transitions in our lives and it's really, really overwhelming to do. There's And there's a lot of complex feelings, not just anxiety, right? A little complex and complicated feelings. So we're going to dive right into listener questions. I also think it might be helpful. Like, let's just name some of the life transitions okay. that people might go through. So like, Going from, I'm going to try to start an order from like college to career. Actually, nobody from, at listens to this, I guess. <laughs> yeah. 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 I wasn't going to, I wasn't going to go younger than that because like getting I, my period, that was getting a big your transition period. Yeah, yeah. We start there. <laughs> getting your period. <laughs> People go get their periods, going to college, driver's license, college, um, uh, post-college experience, getting your first job, maybe going to grad school, um, learn to pay off student loans, friends starting to get married, going, getting also getting in relationships, getting yes. out of relationships, like 
that's a bit, whether it's yeah. friendships, romantic relationships, mm-hmm. um, loss of a loved one, right? Yeah, like par- losing parents, relationships. Or taking care of parents or yes. uh, family members going through health issues and taking yes. care of them, being caregivers you, for that. Also, you going through health issues. That's a big transition to go through. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, career changes. Did we say that yet? Um, career changes, getting animals. Getting animals, big transition. Yeah. Having children. Oof. Not having children and your yeah. friends having children. Yep. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, ending a career, restarting a career, you have career transitions. Retirement, um, right. Retirement, your children getting older, you losing and feeling like you're losing your purpose in life when things transition. These are all huge things can that can impact your mental health and your stability very greatly. Yeah. And we talked about this on last week's episode that as human beings, we love stability. We like love predictability. And so when we go through these life stage transitions, um, it shakes us up. Mm-hmm. but it's a natural part of life. And yep. so that's why we love talking about it a million times over because it's so uncomfortable, but we got to go through it. All right. So how to sit in the discomfort and realize the difference between transitions and the wrong choice. So this is a big one. So, right. So let's say you had this transition you did. Let's say you left a job. We'll use career for this moment. I left a job and I felt really sure about leaving this job. And then what I got into I don't feel as sure about. And so not only is it an adjustment, but let's say I was at my other job for five years. I knew exactly what I was doing. Everyone knew who I was. I didn't love it, but it, it was very safe. I get into this new thing. All of a sudden, I'm the newbie. I'm learning everything. It's very hard being new at something. And so then it feels like this is a mistake, right? And so the question is, is what is typical, normal, transitional difficulty? And then what is, holy shit, I made the wrong choice? And it's going to take a while to figure out which one it is, unless you have some internal thing being like, woo, 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 here, bitch. Um, and that's what I imagine mine sounds like. But um, <laughs> that's what my body says. It's to like me. a, uh, it's like a, uh, a horn. <laughs> It's was like that those, what like, you think a horn sounds like? It was like those, um, you know, if you're like, I haven't been to a club in quite some time, but you know, those clubs that are like, burr, 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 burr. Oh, like in Cancun or something, yes, right? Exactly. Like you go on spring break, Acapulco. Yeah, like, yeah, burr, yeah. Burr, yeah. Burr. Yes, I'm the police exactly. here? I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Why did I take ecstasy from a stranger on the street? You know, those are all things we've dealt with in our life. Talk about a transition versus the wrong choice. But so, okay. So let's say you have this internal cue. <laughs> That's like something does not feel right. And what I would, what we sort of talked about in terms of last week too, is how do you start to take emotion and logic and have them work together? And so uh, my emotion is this does not feel good. This feels wrong. It feels bad, right? The logic is, hey, it is normal to feel out of place starting something new. It is normal to feel overwhelmed when you're the newbie there. It is normal to feel overwhelmed starting a whole new thing. And so how do you start to bring these together? And what together might look like is creating some rituals and routines for yourself during this time of transition. And then saying to yourself, all right, I'm going to give, give yourself a timeline. I don't have to stay here for the next 10 years of my fucking life, but I'm going to try this for the next three months. All right. I get to three months. That was bearable. Okay. I'm gonna try it for the next six months. And you keep going with that of what this could feel like to do. Let's say then you get to like a year of being there because you want to have that on your resume. You're at some place. That's great. Whatever like rational thing you want to do. And you're like, wow, I still really don't like this. Okay, great. Now, you know, but when we talk about the idea of the wrong choice, you will make lots of choices in your life and you're not going to love all of them as the best thing ever, but they're going to give you a ton of information. So I also think, what if we were to transition the wording away from the wrong choice to not the right choice yet? Yeah. Or, think- or just not the choice that works for me right now. Right. Right. Yeah. I th- I love that transition from going from the wrong choice to, um, this isn't right for me in this moment. Yeah. You know what this also brought up the idea of like when people go through breakups and, um, the discomfort of being out, it, it's it, trying to find the difference between the discomfort of being out of the relationship and just transitioning to singlehood to, um, slash, do I miss this person? Do I want to be back in this relationship? Um, 
And I think that that so often gets confused of like, I, especially if you're the one who did the breaking up with, um, I made this choice for a reason. Maybe this wasn't working out. Maybe it was a mutual breakup. Um, and the confusion between, okay, it is hard to transition from being in a relationship to not being in a relationship. There's mm-hmm. so many changes that comes that come with that. Um, and so I think so often the transition gets confused or the discomfort gets confused for should I be back in this relationship or should I be in a relationship in general? Because the discomfort is driving you, the discomfort is driving you towards something different as opposed mm-hmm. to like, this is no, this is a natural part of making the transition from being in a relationship to not being in a relationship. And how do I manage this discomfort? Yeah. Um, the next question I really want to make sure we get to, so I'm just starting there. Decision paralysis with change. Is it fear? And for an example, I can't plan our wedding, but I really want to. So it sounds like whenever there is some type of paralysis like that, I also want to talk about what is the pressure around it. Is it the pressure because your sibling had the best wedding ever? Is it because um, you are worried about, um, you have two divorced parents, you're worried about pleasing both of them, right? Like what are the things that's putting so much pressure that's making it paralyzing? Let's say you're like, oh, but I don't have any of those things. Everything's great. Everything's perfect, which is never fully true, but okay. Um, And you tell yourself that. So then what is the pressure you're internally putting on yourself? What are you telling yourself this needs to look like? Could this, right? Like you want to plan this wedding, but like, would you be happy with just things in the backyard? Like, does it have to be this insane thing? What is the pressure? What is the expectation? And I would imagine if it is too overbearing, you're going to feel like you can't do anything. And that's when we get to stuckness. So pretty much what you're saying is, it, is it actually about the change, right? Is it necessarily about the change or is it about internalized pressure, externalized pressure? I think yeah. that's a really good question to ask yourself. And what about this one? How to cope when friends' lives are changing, but yours mm. isn't. The thing that I want to say about that is what does it mean to you? Like what meaning are you making about the fact that your friend's lives are changing and yours isn't. Yeah. What's Does, the internal dialogue? Yeah. What, yeah. What's the dialogue? What's, what are the things that you're saying to yourself um, about your life not changing? Does that feel like it's wrong in some way? Mm. You know, I think that so often we have these expectations of this is how my life is supposed to change or transition. Um, and sometimes our, our lives don't follow that path. And so can you accept um, kind of the way in which your your life is um, maybe staying in this position or is like, is this really about your friend's life changing and like the meaning that you're making of it? Or do you actually want something different and you don't know how to make that change? Um, so that's what I would want to understand is what is the meaning behind others lives changing and yours not is it something that you do you actually want to change or do you not want to change and just feel this external Mm. pressure okay um it goes to this other question let's see if we can bring this together is anxiety of being ahead of some friends but behind others Mm. who's ranking this the race (laughs) this is right where are we going what what where are we going where, with this? Where are right? we going? What are you telling yourself of where we're going? What are you telling yourself about this? And are you using other people as the guideline for where you should be? And that is going to be get very complicated because we are all very, very different. So if you are doing this race, um, then you, you go into this place of like, then I'm going to win or lose. And that sounds like a not fun place to be. It's something we talk about actually in sex therapy is the idea of like a pleasure focused model versus a goal oriented model. And so I think that we can also bring that within our lives of like, what would a pleasure focused and joyful focused um, model and expectation be for ourselves? Yeah. Yeah, What's the the final goal? We all die. I mean, (laughs) yes. (laughs) Jesus. I mean, I know that's morbid, but like, isn't it kind of true? But I think it's also right. So like, if you're, if you're looking at as like this race or this ranking, my question would be what part of your self-worth are you attaching to being in this race? And 
you know, I think that social media might play a part in this too. I don't know if you know, but Emily's off the gram. <laughs> How many times can we mention it? <laughs> I don't know if you know, but I am now an <laughs> elevated being. She's on while I'm on Reddit level. 30 yeah, hours yeah, a day. Exactly. <laughs> Um, but I would want to know, like, what do you feel like it means about you? And let's just listen. If you're listening to this and you're realizing, yeah, I do have this internalized model. Like my self-worth is connected to being in this race and like where I am. This is something that we've all experienced. Like society has pushed this on us from a very, very early age. You know, Emily and I have talked about this. We felt this way around the time where we were getting married. We very cared, much so this, we cared and so much if our I, neither of our husbands listen to this but if they did i'm sorry mm-hmm. to say this but like i cared so much about getting engaged me too all these people were getting engaged around me it felt so important to me it felt like their relationships were more valid than mine because i wasn't engaged and i like lost my mind over it and now i'm like what was the rush for <laughs> truly and and but it speaks to how ingrained it was in us. And it does. There are points where it does feel like some sort of race or some sort of like self-worth thing of like, I, I need this in order to feel validated in some way. I mean, I literally remember saying to myself and my friends, well, I'm going to have my first kid by 25 and be done by 30. I mean, (laughs) that ended up true, but that's just because it was an only child. You were a child bride, I, I, as you expected. I, I told everyone, I feel like I was a child bride and a teen mom because I had my daughter at 29, and that feels really young to have a kid now. That, like, it does. 29 feels, like, really young to have a child. But it is, but it just speaks to, like, how real this internalized yes. pressure is. Like, and we were therapists at this point. Like, we've done this. We did this work, and we thought about this. We talked about that. But yeah. it, it was so real and ingrained in us. And we thought that it was going to make us more valid in our careers, right? So the other part was that we were, the (laughs) other part was that we were 26 year old couples therapists that were not married. Yeah. And there was a fear that people would not see you as valid, which is such a fucked up thing to say, but like in our society, like it feels like, I mean, I've heard like stories about people be like, oh, they got to like, this person got a promotion over someone else because they're married. So they seem more stable. And so it is like, we think, tell people like, they don't become adults until they're married. And that is yes. fucked up. And you know, it's interesting. Um, I have this conversation with my husband too, that like he, when he shows houses, um, he's a realtor. He, he's like, um, I need to, he wears this ring, but he's like, you know, my ring makes me less threatening. Like as a man, you know, like, mm-hmm. and when you're like meeting someone for the first time, um, it's, it's just interesting what it means for different people at different stages in their lives. Yeah. Which is so funny. Cause like how many married men are creeps. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I know. Right. It's true. And how many, un- but and he, how many married people are unstable? I mean, yeah, like, yeah, it's, yeah. Like, it's funny. Like, but, thing, but it's like, the meaning. Yeah. yeah. You know? Yes. But I think we're also talking about like this, the extreme anxiety you experience, um, during this process. Yes. It's, or if it's ingrained. It's so ingrained. Um, okay. Um, uh, I oh, I love this. One. I was a teen parent, and my youngest is now twenty. Why do I suddenly feel so lost and sad? First of all, I would imagine being a teen parent, you work really fucking hard to not have people see you a certain way. There is such a stigma around it. It is such a difficult thing to do. I imagine you work really, really hard to be an amazing parent to this person um, in some ways to prove it to yourself, to prove it to other people, to write, to just live and exist within this world. So now they're 20 and everyone's out of the house and all of a sudden you have time to think and feel about yourself. And that is a loss of the world that you have known for so many years. Yeah. And you spent so much time, so much of, of like your younger years, right. Where people were going out and focusing on themselves Mm -hmm. and being, um, you know, impulsive and you were spending this time raising a human being 
that ages, you know, that matures you in a way. Um, and you're so focused on someone else for so many years. And now you're at the point where you have all the space to finally focus on yourself. And I just wonder if there's maybe grief that's coming up with that of like, now I'm grieving maybe this, this time that I didn't have focusing on myself. It's a new feeling to just yeah. focus on yourself and say, how do I take care of myself? What does this look like for me? I mean, that is a huge transition to go through. And also, you know, through all these transitions, I should just say this as a caveat, so important to like give yourself support from your friends and family and a therapist if you need it. Um, you know, to be able to talk about some of these things or feel like you have other people who are in the same position. And I think what can be tough too is that because you had a child so young, you might be in a complete, completely different life stage than like others your age. And so it might be the case that maybe you connect with, with empty nesters who are a little bit older than you. And so I would say, what does that look like in terms of like gathering this social support? Um, it might look like connecting with people who are at different ages. Yeah. And that's okay. And I think you're also allowed to be sad. Yeah. And you're allowed to feel lost and it's reasonable. And it's something that people are going to experience so many times and not just you. And it makes sense. I, I think all of it makes so much sense. It is so valid. And now you get to find yourself in a different way, a different part of yourself that you couldn't access before. Mm -hmm. And that's going to be scary and overwhelming. And it also could be really fucking amazing. Yeah. The thing I like to remind everyone is that people that have gone through a lot of shit, you're badass. Yeah. We have this idea like, oh, I'm so fucked up. I went through these things. But like, you're also just like really fucking badass and resilient and, and amazing. So resilient. Like human beings in general are so... Mm -hmm. resilient it's I always say this the most amazing part of being a therapist is being able to recognize how resilient people are and I think when you are at the beginning stages of a life transition and you are feeling the sadness and this loneliness and this grief there's a sense of like I'm never going to get out of this or this is just like how it is for the rest of time but like you will you will find a different part of yourself. You will get through this. It just takes time. Yeah. And so remind yourself how resilient you are and know that this is temporary. Yeah. And think, I want you to think about and process, maybe journal about how to give yourself support during this time and how to nurture yourself through this transition. Yeah. Um, Here's one we always get. We always go back to this one. How to prepare for parenthood mentally, relationally, in terms of friendships. Here's what I would say. Set yourself up for success and it's all going to blow up too, right? So what I mean like that is like, so let's say you're having a difficulty with your child sleeping. Who do you call for that? You have a difficulty uh, breastfeeding, formula feeding. Who who do I call for that? Do you, I have difficulty in my marriage? What's my resources for that, right? So if you set yourself up for here are the things that I know could be difficult here are the way I'm going to set myself up and know that it's just going to change everything. And the only way we get past that is adapt. But preparing yourself, I also really love um, the shit no one tells you when you're pregnant. And then there's the shit no one tells you about your first year. And both of those are very, very hilarious and well-written. And I highly recommend them. Um, but sometimes we can't always prepare. And sometimes we prepare because we want to control. But life transitions in a lot of ways are giving up control and just honoring up whatever the fuck we have to the universe, whatever you believe. Beautiful. Huge social anxiety, trying to make friends in a new place help. Mm. First, I want to validate this is hard. This is hard. Um, you know, making friends in adulthood can be challenging, especially if you're not in like smaller circles. So what I would say about the social, what is the fear, right? Is the fear you're going to go up to someone and they're going to reject you. You're going to go up to someone and it's not going to work out in some way. Get down to what is underlying the social anxiety. Um, I would say also find ways to make your groups smaller. Find smaller groups that you can join um, that 
maybe share in your likes or your values. Um, I don't know if you like going hiking, like go on a hike, um, join a hiking group. Um, and I think that so often, e even with joining those groups, there's this like, oh God, what's this going to be like? Am I not going to like anyone? And the thing is like, let's say you go, let's say it sucks. You never have to go again. Let's say you don't meet anyone. You I never have to do it again. Anytime I go to say anything like that, I always tell myself when I can always leave yep. and two, I never have to do this again. And exactly. that helps me so much. And if you never push yourself to go, you're never going to know. Yeah. You're never. And the more that you push yourself into these small situations that do bring up anxiety, the more you're going to trust yourself to do it again. Mm -hmm. The more you're going to know, okay, I did that. Maybe it sucked. Maybe I got nothing out of it, but I did it and I got myself through it. When you don't push yourself through the anxiety, it reinforces this idea that my anxiety is taking control of what I can and can't do. And it reinforces this idea that you can't do it. You won't be able to do it. And your anxiety is controlling your actions. Yeah. And so the fact of the matter is you are going to have social anxiety. That's part of going into new situations. Emily is the friendliest person, so extroverted, and she still has to say this to herself. Yes. And so that's the thing I want to drive home is that like everyone experiences this. Mm -hmm. Maybe Every, not to the same degree. Right. Um, and so it's natural. It's natural to feel this. Um, but clearly you want more connection. You want yeah. more friends. And the only way to do that is put your, push yourself out of your comfort zone. Yeah. I know that's so cliche, but it is so important. And I think also lower expectations, right? Like you're if you move to a new place and you don't know anyone there, it's going to take a long time to make community. I mean, hey, listen, if you join a, a hiking club the first day and you walk out with 50 friends, that's fucking awesome. I just don't you think know. there's 50 friends hiking <laughs> together. <laughs> How are you making it up that mountain? <laughs> Someone was just telling me about a, a birth lot. Someone was just telling me about a birthday party they had. There was like 80 people. I was like, you know 80 people? Like that's wild. Um that might be our summer get together. I well, that's true. I know. But that's cuz people bring their partners. <laughs> true. And dogs. You got to count all that, right? Got to count the dogs. But um so I I think that there's it's also saying to yourself like, okay, what's reasonable to want and expect out of the situation? Is it more reasonable to go in and say, I'm going to find a new place to hike than make connections? I think that's probably a safe way to go in, right? Is it reasonable to say, what am I going to do to take care of myself afterwards? And how am I going to, the other thing I want you to do is like, if you're someone who's highly anxious and then you spend, you, after you leave, you do a lot of spiraling or ruminating thoughts. What are the coping skills I have already in place to help me with anxious and spiraling thoughts? Love. All right. I, um, we, we're at the end of our time. We have nothing else. Oh, okay. okay. That was when you fuck around so much at the beginning. Okay. Um, <laughs> dear Em and Jen, my husband and I have been together for 10 years, 36 and 34 respectively. We love each other more than words can express. And we always thought we'd have kids, but the older I get, the more reserved I am about having them. My husband was born to be a dad. I know that if we don't move forward with having kids, our relationship will likely end. What are ways to help cope when a relationship might end, not because the love died, but because important life choices don't align anymore? This is pulling at my heartstrings. Yeah. Yeah. This is such a, just like mature way to think about your relationship. Yeah. And like beautiful way to think about your relationship. Um, because for you to be able to say, you know, we got together 10 years ago where maybe our values and our goals aligned and now we're at the place where they don't anymore. And realistically, we have to have a conversation about that. And you may have had a beautiful 10 years of marriage. And I think so often we think about marriages and right. We say we get married for life, right? You choose one partner and it's a lifetime you're together, but we talk about this all the time. It is a reality that you can grow apart in a relationship and not, for, and in this example, it's for the fact that your values or what you want out of life no longer aligns. And it's okay 
to grow in different directions. And how amazing is this that you can acknowledge that that you have different goals now and to be able to have that conversation the thing that i the thing that's absolutely going to be hard is this is this is a, a grief to go through it is hard when you are ending a relationship but there is such love in that relationship you know sometimes it's easier to get through things when there's like anger you know, there's still a lot of emotion yeah. behind it, but wait, yeah. I'm pissed off. You cheated on me. whatever it is, you know, like the, the anger kind of drives you in a lot of, but when there's so much love and respect and care for each other, um, it can make it, it, that's why I say it's such like a beautifully mature thing to do, to be able to make that decision to say, like, we no longer share the same goals and values. And that is a reality. And it is a reality to be able to have that conversation. And it might take a bunch of conversations to be able to get to that point. But just the fact that you're being so honest with yourself about what you want and how it's important for you to move forward with what you want and same thing with your partner. Yeah. Ooh. I know. I know. I love this person. Me too. We appreciate you. Thank you for writing this in. Yeah. Because I think, I also think that this will really help other people who are maybe, maybe grappling with this in their relationship. Yeah. So that's our episode. And that's the episode of Shrink Chicks today. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> it's beautiful. Thank you so much for listening. Um, if you found this episode helpful for you, you think it would be helpful for a friend, send it on over to them. Don't forget to rate, review, subscribe, follow on Apple Podcasts. Um, we have a Know Yourself, Grow Yourself journal um, on Amazon. So we can link that in the show notes. We will put it on our Instagram. It has 25 prompts um, that you are not held to do. You get to make your choices. Um, but we wanted to give you some prompts. If you are looking for a therapist, um, reach on out to the therapy group at the therapygroup.com. You can fill out a contact form. We will connect you with one of our incredible therapists, or if we do not serve your state or you're looking for something else, we will connect you with someone else. We want to make sure everyone gets the help that they need. Um, and that's it. Don't forget to grow yourself. You got to know yourself. We'll see you next time. Hey!